Good evening. Welcome to this episode of Cocktails with a Curator. I am Xavier Salomon, the Deputy Director and Peter J. Sharp Chief Curator at the Frick. This month of December, we celebrate the Frick Collection's 85th anniversary. Only a couple of days ago, it was the exact anniversary. On the 16th of December, 1935, the Frick Collection opened to the public. But December is a month for us rich in anniversary. Tomorrow, the 19th of December, would have been Henry Clay Frick's 171st birthday. So Frick was born in December of 1849. Uh, the museum opened in December, and as we will see, Frick also died in December. So many of the anniversaries relating to the history of the museum all fall in this month. Of course, looking at the history of an institution like the Frick is looking at the complexities of history. And we are, for better or for worse, linked to the history of our founder, a history which, as many of you know, is a rather complicated one and a rather controversial one. Frick was born uh, in Western Pennsylvania. He was actually born in the town of West Overton. And what you see here on the left is the house of his maternal uh, family. Uh, his mother was an overholt. Um, and what you see in front of you is the little spring house. Here is an old photo of it and how it appears today, which is the precise site where Frick was born on the 19th of December, 1849. I don't want to go into a full history of Henry Clay Frick today, but what I would like to do is to talk about a specific issue to do with art and Frick, which is the issue of portraiture. But before I do that, it is worth noting um, how Frick came into his wealth and how the Frick Collection was effectively founded. And Frick, as a young man, started in the background of the Overholt family as an accountant and working with his grandfather, his maternal grandfather, who had a whiskey factory not far from West Overton. And um, here you see uh, an, an old advert for overhauled whiskey and the factory where um, Frick would have worked as a young man helping his grandfather uh, in the whiskey production. Because of this, I am drinking an old fashioned, the most uh, obvious and delicious cocktail you can make with whiskey, uh, very simple to make. Um, but also I feel an old fashioned is an appropriate cocktail for what we're talking about today, definitely for Mr. Frick himself, but also in many ways for the Frick collection. Cheers. Frick's fortune, as we all know, was not, however, linked to whiskey. Very early on, as a young man in his 20s, he started investing in Coke. And he invested in Coke because Coke was linked very directly with um, steel. And of course, the, the burgeoning um, industry of steel in Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania at that time, uh, most of the steel produced um, in that period, in the second half of the 19th century uh, in the world, was produced in Pittsburgh. And Frick and his Coke company partnered with Carnegie and a number of other people, um, creating a great empire. By age 30, Frick was already a millionaire. Of course, this fortune was based on uh, the exploitation of workers and on a number of uh, events which put Frick in a very complicated light for us to understand today. Uh, this is one of the remaining steel factories, abandoned but still in place, uh, on the river in Pittsburgh. And of course, it was not far away from here that in the 1890s, the Homestead strike took place. Uh, and of course, Frick's name is indelibly linked um, to this uh, terrible and tragic event. And of course, all of us working at the Frick Collection cannot think of Frick's biography and his life without considering uh, this and a number of other events to do with his career as a businessman. Of course, this had repercussions on him as, uh, as, as an individual, and only in, in the same year there was an assassination attempt uh, when uh, an anarchist uh, walked into his office and shot him twice and stabbed him. Frick, however, survived. 
But this series of events, the Homestead strike and the, the assassination attempt, uh, made him think about um, changing somewhat his life and moving away from Pittsburgh and moving to New York, which effectively he does in 1905 for good. It is also worth thinking briefly about Frick's family. And here is a photo taken soon after his wedding to Adelaide Childs. Um, and Henry Clay and Adelaide have four children, two of whom die as, as children around the time of the Homestead strike and the assassination attempt. So this really proves to be a, a very uh, heavy period for him. But two of them survive. And the two surviving um, children, Helen Clay and Childs, become very important for the history of the Frick. Childs, of course, is the first head of the board of the, of the museum when Frick dies, but Helen Clay is involved as the head of the acquisitions committee, as a very vociferous and important trustee, and of course, not um, unimportantly, as the head uh, and the, the, the founder of the Frick Art Reference Library, which in fact celebrates its centenary this year. It was founded in 1920. So in fact, that the library uh, was created a year after the death of Henry Clay by his daughter. So in many ways, father and daughter, they will both be part of today's episode because they're both indelibly link, linked to the creation of the Frick Collection. And the, the museum has the family's surname in, in its name to celebrate these two, in many ways, co-founders. Now, talking about portraiture, I would love the idea of having a great portrait of Frick in the museum, celebrating the founder of the museum by a great artist like Sargent. And we almost did, but in the end, we didn't. And in our archives, we have a letter by Sargent to Frick, undated, which reads, I beg to state that if the object of your visit should happen to be a commission for portraiture, I feel bound to inform you that I'm not taking any commissions and not adding any promises to those I have already made for the future. Now, we don't know when this uh, dates from, probably the 19-teens. Uh, we assume Frick was traveling to London and the letter comes from London and he must have inquired with Sargent about a portrait. Now, we don't know if this would have been a portrait of Henry Clay Frick himself or maybe even a portrait of his daughter. Um, we don't know. But clearly Sargent was in a phase of his career where he was uh, rejecting commissions for portraiture and focusing on other projects. So unfortunately, this is um, what remains of the possibility of a grand portrait like, of course, the marvelous portrait of Dr. Dr. Pozzi at home in the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles. We do have portraits of Frick. This is one of the most visible ones in the museum. This is in the library uh, in the house. But none of these portraits were actually made during Frick's own lifetime. He was notoriously shy, taciturn. We know very little about Frick the man. What did he think about his life? What did he think about his career, his business? What did he think about the events, not only of the Homestead strike, but of a number of other uh, events to do with his business career? And what did he think about the artworks? This is a question that I'm often asked by visitors at the museum. And the unfortunate answer is we know pretty much nothing. Uh, there are rumors about which ones were his favorite works, uh, which ones were the ones he paused by to look at. But apart from acquiring the works and having a lot of documents about these acquisitions, we don't have any personal insight insight as to what the man thought about the works, what he liked about them, what he um, saw into them. So we have a few photographs of Frick, but we don't have any contemporary portraits. And these portraits, the ones we have, were made long after he died. This, for example, was by the, is by the Danish artist jo John Johansson, who was a Danish man who moved as a young man to America, studied in Chicago, became a great society portraitist. But this was commissioned by Helen Clay, by the daughter, in 1943. Um, and it's only been in the library of the house since then when Helen Clay donated it to the museum and it was based on, on photographs. Um, obviously, John Johansson never met uh, Frick in, in, in his lifetime. But today I would like to focus on this artwork, the bust, the marble bust that sits in the entrance hall of the Frick. It's been there ever since the museum opened in this blind arch between the two open arches to the right, as soon as you walk in. 
And this bust is by a female artist. It's actually by a, a great sculptor from the 20th century, a woman called Malvina Hoffman, uh, who was born in New York in 1885 and died in 1966. Um, we have very few works at the Frick by women artists. And this is one of them, and not many people know this when they look at the bust in the entrance hall and as they're uh, walking into the, the building um, to get their tickets and visit the museum. And I'm very proud of, of, of the fact that the bust of the founder in the entrance hall is actually made uh, by a woman. But the story behind this bust and this artist is really also a fascinating and in many ways a complex one. Malvina Hoffman is well known for her sculptures, mostly in bronze, some in stone. Um, especially, she was known at the time for sculptural groups of dancers. This is one that I'm showing you. But she also became well known for her portraits and her depictions of, of individuals. This is one of my favorite works by her. And this is entitled uh, Martinique Woman. It's actually unclear if the sitter was from Martinique, but it's meant to represent a woman from Martinique. This was um, carved around 1928, and it is made out of this incredibly beautiful polished black stone. And this is now at the Brooklyn Museum. Malvina Hoffman worked on a number of monumental projects also that are the sort of projects, large stone sculptures that are usually associated with men. And I find it fascinating that in the early 20th century, uh, she was at work on, on objects like this, on works of art like this. This is Bush House in London uh, it, at, at Oldwich. Uh, it is actually just in front of where I studied, the Cortal Institute of Art. And this was built in the 1920s as a trade outpost for relationships between England and America. And it was sponsored by uh, Mr. Bush, who was uh, an American. And it was considered one of the most lavish and expensive buildings built in London around that time. It is then uh, transformed later on into the headquarters of the BBC, and it became very well known as that. And it now serves a number of different uh, purposes. But at the very top of this entrance, magnificent entrance to this building, you see two large sculptures of men uh, holding a flame together and with coat of arms on the left and right. And these, of course, are statues representing on the left, the United Kingdom, on the right, the United States of America. And it shows the friendship between the two um, countries. This is a photo that I particularly love, um, showing Melvina Hoffman uh, putting up some of the finishing touches um, to the sculpture of the United Kingdom on the left, um, as it is placed in situ at Bush House. Melvina Hoffman, however, like Frick, is not a character without controversial um, issues. And she was very famous during her lifetime for this very grand commission of a series of life-size sculptures for what was known as the Hall of Man or the Hall of the Races of Mankind at the Field Museum, the Natural History Museum in Chicago. And of course, this is a project which to our eyes today uh, is a, a, in many ways uh, involved with racist views of the world. And that is why already in the 1960s, this hall was taken down and it's not on view anymore. But here you see Malvina Hoffman herself next to one of these sculptures uh, for this project. And she traveled widely and did sketches and, and met people of different races and different backgrounds uh, to create this project. This again is to say that not everyone in the history of an institution like the Frick or like any other institution in the world can be a hero in every possible way, unfortunately. And so we, we have to confront these problematic aspects of the career of an artist like Melvina Hoffman or the, uh, the career of a businessman at the end of the 19th century like Henry Clay Frick. But the commission for Melvina Hoffman came early on from Frick. So Frick, and this I find fascinating, commissioned uh, a female artist, a woman artist, to do a bust of his beloved daughter, Helen Clay. And this happened, um, we don't have a lot of documentation on this, but this must have happened just before uh, Frick died. And it turns out that Miss Frick and Melvina Hoffman at that time became quite good friends. 
Miss Frick was very interested in French 18th century sculpture, Houdon in particular, and she was planning to write a monograph on Houdon. So here you see the plaster model painted as if uh, made out of terracotta uh, of the bust of Miss Frick. Very 18th century in feel, uh, very Houdon-like in a number of ways. Think of the bust of, of Kaila and, and some of the other busts by Houdon at the Frick and in other museums. We knew very little about this bust because even though it was made in marble, it was supposedly destroyed soon after by Miss Frick herself, who didn't like it. And according to Malvina Hoffman's own words, she took a hammer to it and smashed it into pieces and the bust doesn't survive anymore. This plaster uh, model for it, this plaster prototype, came to us only in 2016 and is now on view in the reading room of the Frick Art Reference Library, appropriately. And this came to us as a gift from the descendants of Malvina Hoffman, who still had it packed in a crate since she left it and um, it's the only thing that survives to give us an idea of what the marble would have looked like originally. And soon after this was, was commission made, and soon after Frick's death in 1919, Helen Clay commissions Malvina Hoffman to make a bust of her father. And this is a bust that was um, started in 1920, a year after Frick's death, and was completed in 1922. And this is the marble bust that is now in the entrance hall at the Frick. It was based partly on photographs, partly on memory. Melvina Hoffman had met Frick, obviously, earlier on during the time of the Miss Frick Commission. Um, and this is really the closest in terms of date uh, and accuracy that we have, apart from obviously photographs, of Frick's appearance. And it was a very successful bust, and it became, in many ways, the um, key image, the key artwork representing Frick. This was produced in a number of versions, and the prime version supposedly is the one at the Frick Collection, made for the museum, but there is a plaster version of it, possibly preparatory and painted as if made in fake bronze. This is now at the New York Historic Society, and um, it, was, it was given by Malvina Hoffman in the 60s with a group of other portraits in plaster to the Historical Society uh, as, uh, as a gift, and so that is now uh, at the New York Historical Society, but Miss Frick commissioned two further marbles, same size, same uh, exact uh, appearance, one for Clayton for the house in Pittsburgh, the family house, which is now, of course, the, uh, the Frick Museum in, in, in Pittsburgh, and this is still displayed there. The second one instead was displayed in the foyer of the Frick building in Pittsburgh, and these were the headquarters of the Frick uh, business, built for Henry Clay Frick. He had his offices on one of the top floors. And um, as you walk in here, you see it uh, rather festively decorated with uh, holiday decorations a few years ago when I took this photo. Um, but it is, again, another version of the Hoffman bust. And another one in bronze, in this case, is instead at the McKinley Memorial Library in Niles, Ohio, a library where Frick um, donated some funds as well. And so he is commemorated there, again, in the entrance with this uh, bronze bust. Finally, Melvina Hoffman worked on a another portrait of Frick, and this is for uh, this building in Pittsburgh, which is the art history um, headquarters, the, uh, the, the Frick building, the so-called Frick building uh, of the University of Pittsburgh. And this was largely sponsored by Helen Clay Frick, who was, of course, very interested in art history, very interested in her father's legacy. As I said, she created the library, the Frick Art Reference Library, but she also uh, funds the art history department at the University of Pittsburgh. And if you look at this image, you see that at the center of the facade, there is a roundel. And that roundel, of course, has the portrait of Frick. And this was made in, again, in the 1920s, probably around 1922, at the same time as the marble bust. And this is a plaster life-size model for it, where you see almost as a giant medal, the image of Frick in profile with the dates 1849, 1919, um, and some sketches probably relating to how the bus would have, how the, the roundel would have sat within the facade. This was also uh, passed on to the Frick collection uh, in 1967 by the uh, Malvina Hoffman estate when um, a year after she died in 1966. This is usually in storage, but we're very much hoping to be able to display it uh, in the future. 
Uh, and it, it sort of goes to conclude this period in the 19, late 19-teens, early 1920s, where Malvina Hoffman is very involved with the Frick family to produce these three portraits, the one of Miss Frick, the one of Mr. Frick, and the roundel with the profile of Mr. Frick. And I am very happy that obviously at the Frick, we now have uh, objects linked to all three, the plaster models for the roundel and the bust of Miss Frick, and the actual original marble of uh, the portrait of Frick. As I mentioned uh, at the beginning, December is also the anniversary of Mr. Frick's death. Uh, Mr. Frick died at 170th Street in what we now call the Walnut Room, which was on the second floor and is um, was the bedroom of Mr. Frick, and it's been used as a meeting room uh, ever since. Uh, he died there on the 2nd of December 1919. So in fact, this year is the 101st anniversary of his death. He was buried, however, um, with the rest of his family uh, in Pittsburgh, in the cemetery in Pittsburgh, not far away from, uh, from Clayton. And so again, this link between New York and Pittsburgh is, uh, is, is, is very strong, obviously, uh, with the family. But what remains as his enduring monument is the Frick Collection, of course. And uh, in his will of 1919, so 101 years ago, Frick creates this museum. And whatever we know, understand, and whatever we think about Henry K. Frick as a man, and myself having worked at the Frick Collection for a long time and um, loving this institution, I often feel ambivalent about his life as, as a businessman and, and many of the events around it. But we cannot uh, undermine the fact that he made a momentous decision in 1919 and probably before that. And that was the, the decision to donate the house, everything in it, the great art collection and funds to maintain this house to create a museum. A museum that was to be open to the public. And as he says in his will, and again, this is an incredible sentence uh, for 1919, this is a, is a museum for all people whomsoever. And we cannot think of the fact that Frick had choices. Making this museum, giving this museum to all of us, to posterity, was a, a, a choice he didn't have to make. He could have made a very different one. And so for this, I'm obviously very grateful. And I think for this, we still have to uh, celebrate the man while understanding, of course, uh, the complexity of the human being. And that is, in fact, true of most human beings in the world. So with this um, thought, I would like to um, raise a glass to the Frick Collection on its 85th birthday. And I look forward to welcoming you all to Frick Madison, a temporary new home, which will open in early 21, and back to 170th Street in a few years' time, where you will actually be able to visit the second floor and many of the spaces where the Frick family lived and the room in which Henry Clay Frick died. So happy birthday, uh, Henry Clay Frick, for your 171st birthday and happy 85th birthday to the Frick Collection. Good evening.